Welcome to the Inbox Segment Part 7. In this, I'll try and answer all your questions. It's been about three months since the last one. There's quite a lot about antennas, but first of all, we'll cover the homebrew transmitter and receiver topics. Grandmaster Stalin, with a very long name, wanted to know what converter I used for my dongle to upconvert HF to VHF that the dongles normally cover. It's fairly simple, using a double balance mixer, four diodes and some ferritoids, plus a VHF oscillator, I think from memory 125 megahertz. You can get them in little metal modules. There's a lot of circuits on the web for an up converter that will work quite well. Or you can do as what was described in a recent Sprat where you could make some internal modifications to the dongle and I think it's changing a putting in a new ferritoid and then you can get HF without an external converter required. So there's a couple of ways you can do it. Hi to Roberto, DG1MJH. Looking forward to your visit to Australia fairly soon. Eric William M asked about the parasitics, or should I say harmonics, from those LIPD, or low power UHF data transmitter modules. Must admit, I haven't measured them. I don't have any equipment for those sorts of frequency ranges. But yeah, I'd, I'd imagine the rejection wouldn't be all that high. But if you do have 23 centimeter amateur equipment, that being three times the frequency of 433 megahertz, then you could at least have a listen to the third harmonic and maybe even do some range tests. That would be quite an interesting experiment. Now block diagrams, that was the video that described various simple transmitter and receiver modules and put them together to various configurations. Stellarat wanted to know a little bit more about how you actually connected them together. Um, what I'd suggest is have a look at my first video on the Beach 40. That's a double sideband transmitter or transceiver and that uses all of the simple modules that were described, all the simple blocks. That is a 30 minute video but it goes through the circuit in quite a bit of detail so hopefully that will be helpful for you. Cheap kites. They were a lot of fun but I must admit I haven't flown any lately. But Phil Drew asked why didn't I just use a helium balloon? Good question. I haven't looked at the price of helium but apparently it's fairly expensive. I don't have room to have a cylinder. I presume that's what you do. You buy a cylinder and, uh, and keep it in your garage or something. I'd imagine the helium balloon would only be good if the wind is fairly calm. But if you've tried it, feel free to leave some comments below. In relation to the foundation introduction to 10 meters, G4KDX thought that FM was a difficult mode for QRP. I couldn't agree more, and I call it the frustrating mode. Because contrary to popular belief, 10 meters is only solidly open for some of the time. A lot of the time signals are very weak and you need as much power as you can get. Going to FM rather than SSB means you're throwing away a lot of power, maybe 8 to 10 dB or more. And if you're going through a repeater, it's even more complex. You've got both fading between you and the repeater and then between the repeater and the other guy. So you'll have a lot more success on 10 meters with SSB. One of my most popular videos is the tri-band N-fed antenna, which covers three popular HF bands. Gary J, K8JCR, wanted to know what toroid I used in the small matching unit down the bottom. Well, it's a FT50-43. Now, the toroid number is fairly commonly used in QRP projects, but the F means that it's made of ferrite. The 50 means that it is 0.5 of an inch. For instance, if you had a ferrite that was a FT68, then the 68 means 0.68 of an inch. And the last number at the end, the dash 43, is the type of material. 43 is ferrite type material, often used for HF. You might see other material on toids, for instance the T50-2 is an iron power toid, half an inch in diameter, 
and type 2 material which is good for the lower HF bands. Another common one is type 6 which is iron power for the higher HF bands and lower VHF. Um, if you're running QRP, half inch diameter is okay, otherwise use a bigger toroid for higher power, maybe uh, an inch or even two inches for really high power. And yep, you can use PVC pipe, that works okay for the loading coil. On homebrew double sideband, Garth Williams, ZS6GW, wanted to know about receiving double sideband on a direct conversion receiver. For instance, if you had two direct conversion double sideband transceivers and wanted to talk to each other. Yep, it doesn't sound all that good. It helps if you're both crystal controlled so that you're at least exactly on frequency. But it will still sound kind of funny. To overcome that, use a SSB transmitter at one end, or alternatively, some sort of sideband rejecting receiver at the other end. Uh, the simplest way is possibly a phasing receiver, the type that cancels out the other sideband without any frequency conversion, or alternatively just the normal superhead type with a crystal filter. But either of those will allow you to receive double sideband. Um, in practice it's not much of a problem because most contacts with QRP gear are to other stations running SSB and usually high power as well. Uh, but it is an interesting curiosity and it's a strange effect when you listen to a double sideband signal on a direct conversion receiver. DDS VFOs. Alejandro wanted to know if he could use an IQ VFO using two AD9850s for a phasing receiver. I believe you can, I've never tried it, but keep searching and hopefully you'll find something. Sand in the radio, particularly the FT817 on the beach. A few people are worried about that, including Andrew VK1DA. Um, yep, it's just a cost of going down the beach and operating portable. Um, good idea to clean or vacuum clean and wipe the moisture off your radio, whatever, when you get back home. But I've found the 817 has been a very reliable radio and I think better than some of the other QRP rigs. Some of them have quite big slots in the cabinet. Um, I think they're designed more for sedate QRP operating, either from home or a park bench on a perfect day where there's no humidity. So uh, um, some of the other radios aren't as robust as I'd like, but the 817 so far has been a great performer. Still on the 817, VK4FLIK wanted to know what sort of external power supply or battery I use. I did used to use sealed lead acid, but there's now better batteries available, including LIFEPO. I don't think they're quite as explosive as the straight LIPO, but both those battery types do require an external charger. Another thing is that some of the new batteries you can get, their voltages aren't ideal for the FT817, either too high or too low. One thing about the 817 is that when you increase the supply voltage past a certain point, it will draw more power, but that goes to produce more heat. The transmit power output doesn't go up at all. Anyway, the battery I'm using, I think it's got a specified voltage of 13.2 volts. It's around 8 amp hours and you will need a special charger. From the HBC 101 TV studios is Mohammed Fred who asked, do I need an analog radio to act as a BFO? In this case, he's using another radio to receive SSB signals, but it obviously doesn't have its own BFO. You could, but the other radio must have a local oscillator that produces enough of a signal on either 3.5 or 7 megahertz, or even a subharmonic of that, to be picked up on the main radio that you're doing the receiving on. If not, you could build an external VFO and do the same job. But then, if you're building a VFO, you might as well also build a couple of extra stages, i.e. a product detector and some audio amplifiers, and get a direct conversion receiver. We're now arriving at Parkdale. Or even, and probably cheaper these days, just an HF to VHF up converter and use that with one of those dongles, as I mentioned before, to hear all the signals on your computer. Not as portable, but it's still great fun.
Now small engine dude lives not far from here and hoping to get his standard ham license so good luck with that and hope to work you on the air. To answer your question I'm not in any local ham club but I am a member of the QRP club which is Australia wide. There's also twice yearly QRP gatherings not far away they're called QRP by the Bay and the next one will be in early November. Um, there'll be a bit more publicity on that closer to the date. Now on to antennas. Joe Damasiro wanted to know what antenna was better for shortwave listening on HF, a magnetic loop or a long wire. It varies a lot. The magnetic loop is good for nulling out interference. If you've got local interference coming from say next door then you can turn the loop to reduce the strength of that. But it is a bit of a hassle as the loop is narrow band, so you do have to adjust the loop every time you retune the radio. So for casual listening, the long wire is probably better if you've got room for that. Um, long wire picks up more signal, so the signals will be showing more on the S meter than the loop. As to whether that's better or not, depends on the signal to noise ratio, how clearly you can hear the signal. And if you can hear the signal clearly, but it's not showing as much on the S meter, then that's the better antenna to use. Some listeners have different antennas, which is a good thing because some signals are better received on some antennas than others. For instance, a vertical antenna or a dipole that's mounted fairly high might be better for longer distance signals coming in at lower angles, whereas a low dipole might be better for signals that are closer in. Then there's the effect of things like antenna orientation. A short dipole low to the ground might not be all that directional, but a long wire on a high frequency might have a lot of lobes that come off, some fairly narrow, and also some narrow nulls, so reception can be a bit patchy um, depending on the direction that the signal's coming from. So, no definite answer. Just build a lot of antennas, do a lot of listening, do a lot of experimenting, and hopefully you'll get some that are a good general purpose antennas that will work for you. In the video on half square antennas on the beach, Anthony Cleary wanted to know what direction everything was. Well, the beach is roughly north-south, with west being over the water. Long path to Europe is roughly southeast. Long path to the US, roughly southwest, and short path to Europe, northwest. But I still seem to get quite good results long path into Europe, despite the water not being on my side. If I use a half square antenna along the beach, then its maximum radiation is broadside, i.e. towards the border. Whereas if I was to put the half square on a pier, which is somewhat inconvenient, then the maximum radiation would be north and south. If you did want to set up a gain antenna on a pier so that it fired in the direction that the pier was, then something like phase verticals set up to radiate off the ends of them would be ideal. At least that's what the theory books say. We'll talk a bit more about practice later on. VE6KK wanted to know how does a half square compared with a magnetic loop? I've not done head to head comparisons, but I'd definitely say that half square is better. It's a good low angle DX radiator. So it's the antenna that you might choose if you were operating on the lower HF bands where you can't put up a high dipole and you had a good ground underneath, for instance, near salt water. So the half square is a great antenna if you've got a bit of room on the beach or the magnetic loop if you want something very small but still performs well. David, M0DAD, suggested a hammock antenna suspended between two poles. That is like a two element beam or even a moxon with the elements bent in, mounted on two spreaders. I like the idea but one of the limitations is that spreaders mean extra weight and that can be a problem if you're using lightweight fishing poles to support your antennas. About the best you can support with those are thin wires, so I think spreaders is stretching the friendship. But if you do have solid poles then I think it's a great idea and you could connect ropes so that if you pull on one rope you flip the direction by 180 degrees, which I think has been suggested in some of Legs Moxon's books. And that's one of the themes with homebrew antennas. It's not so much the electrical performance that's decisive, 
but it's the practicality, especially if you need to carry them by hand. That's where lightweight structures, collapsible poles and thin wires can be to an advantage. Just picked up a piece of aluminium fly wire. It's 610 millimetres wide, a metre long. Hopefully I'll use it for antenna experiments. Some people say a small ground mat is more effective than a couple of radials. Uh, possibly used as a floating counter buoys on the beach. Not sure if I'll need to tune it or not. Lots of replies and comments on the going around in circle series of videos where I mess around with the vertical antennas on the beach. Felix Spack pointed out some things about measurement and trying to measure antenna gain. Yep, I think you're right. Um, it is somewhat difficult. Estimators aren't very scientific. But the thing I was hoping for was more than gain, evidence of deep nulls, which can sometimes be 20 dB or more, which should be readily noticeable, even without an S meter. Anyway, quite a few people, including Daniel Stimson, Peter Millis, and Farm 39 Studio, mentioned phase verticals as the answer. I did try a few, messing around with phasing lines and switch boxes, a lot of buying of kayaks and connectors, and putting things in boxes and separating antennas and ground systems. A lot of effort, a lot of work, not the cheapest antennas, and undoubtedly they work very well if you've got everything set up correctly. But for casual portable operating, I found it was a lot of effort. And you probably have to adjust everything all over again when you go to a different location. So phase verticals are no doubt suitable if you're setting something up at home or a portable de-expedition station but otherwise for casual portable operating for one or two hours there may be better antennas to use. I do recommend reading up on phased verticals, the time certainly won't be wasted. The ARRL Antenna Handbook has some good sections, also ON4UN's low band DXing book as well. Um, there's no doubt that phase verticals as a means of getting good low angle gain are particularly suitable for the lower HF bands. And the idea of being able to switch in various phase shift amounts with various lengths of coax cable is also attractive. Just the idea of being able to instantly reverse or change the beam direction without waiting for a rotator has got to be an advantage. Antenna matching though is a little bit critical because if you are switching in different lengths of phasing line, if the antenna at the end isn't exactly 50 ohms, then you'll have some variations and you may need an antenna coupler to tune it out. Um, you should also read up on the Christman method. There's other methods as well like the Llewellyn method, W7EL, for matching phase vertical antennas. So that's been another inbox. As always, leave your comments below and questions to 